I'm Peter Buckley. I'm director of the Business Confucius Institute at the University of Leeds. And I'm, uh, this event's organised by the Confucius Institute and by FT Masterclass. I have to start by saying if a fire alarm goes off, it is not a test. The doors are here, the meeting place is on the grassy area outside, and if anyone wants loos through these doors, just outside. End of health and safety message. <laughs> uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Liam Byrne, MP, who is the Shadow Minister for University Science and Skills. And we're particularly pleased he's here because he's obviously going to talk about his book, Turning to Face the East, How Britain Can Prosper in the Asian Century, which is a question that Confucius Institute, the Business School, and almost everybody else is interested in. And he has the uh, accolade of a full page in the China Daily, uh, October 18th, 24th, which describes his passion and his interest in China. So it's a real pleasure that he's here. Uh, he is the, and has been since 2004, the Member of Parliament for Birmingham Hodge Hill. He's had a very interesting career in health service, police and counter-terrorism, immigration minister, goodness me, minister for the Cabinet Office and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. He also has a real and profound interest in China. He's an honorary fellow of the 48 Group Club a member of the UK-China Leadership Forum, helped to found the UK-China Young Leaders Roundtable, and is a board member of the Great Britain China Centre. So a really important session tonight, which we're looking forward to. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you Great. very much. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure for, for, for me to be here. It's a huge pleasure to be here in what's the first of a number of talks around the country uh, about the book. And I couldn't think actually of a better place to start than here. Here in Leeds, you are you, almost unique, if you can be almost unique, uh, in that you are not just a Confucius Institute, but a business Confucius Institute. I think, Peter, you were saying just one of only three uh, in the world. Um, but you're also the home here in Leeds to one of the most distinguished faculties teaching people, not just from Britain, but from around the world, uh, Mandarin, elements of Chinese civilization, launching people like uh, Richard Pascoe, the current director of the GB China Center, into a career designed to bring Britain and China closer together. In fact, I have been told that Leeds has now probably trained more people in Britain in Mandarin than any other institution in the country. So. It's very appropriate that this is my first stop um, talking uh, about the book. So, the book. The book is nothing more than an attempt to write down what I've heard over the last six or seven years. And it's been a tremendous privilege for me to have been able to meet all sorts of extraordinary people uh, in China. Premier Wen at the official residence. I was involved in launching the economic and finance dialogue between Britain and China. I've travelled across a lot of China uh, and in that time it's been just hugely fortunate for me to be able to meet mayors, vice mayors, frontline workers, people investing, people you know, working on shop floors and what I wanted to do is to basically bring back what I had heard from China to a UK and a European audience. And I wanted to bring that together with a number of conversations with some of Britain's uh, great thinkers, politicians, academics, business people who think about this subject uh, a lot. So the book is no more than an attempt to write down what I'd heard, put a bit of structure on it, and sort of try and throw the frame forward to help prompt a debate about where we go uh, from here. It's not a great burn blueprint for the future of UK-China relations. It is no more than an attempt to try and start an intelligent debate. And I suppose when I started uh, writing this, and indeed when I started my work on UK-China relations, I had no idea uh, the extent to which I was going to have to draw on my Irish DNA with a name like Liam Byrne, 
Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that there's, there's plenty of Irish blood in these veins. My grandfather is from Dublin, my grandmother is from County Sligo. I had no idea that I have to draw on so much of that DNA uh, in my research. Uh, but my goodness, one of the lessons I learned, especially in provincial China, is that they drink more than the Irish. And, uh, you know, when, you know, um, you undertake a, an ambitious project like writing a book, uh, if there is one skill that you need, it is to be able to drink a hell of a lot of baiju. Uh, and so I am now a master uh, at downing the stuff. Um, probably nowhere more difficult than Inner Mongolia. Fu Ying, who was the ambassador um, here in Britain um, some time ago, is from Inner Mongolia herself, actually. And when she was the ambassador and I was in the Home Office, we had to negotiate on a number of very difficult things. And in the margins of those discussions, she often said to me, you know, at some point, I do hope you go uh, to my home province of, of Inner Mongolia. And, and it was a great pleasure to actually lead a group of British parliamentarians to Inner Mongolia um, not too long ago. When you put a group of British parliamentarians together with a drinking culture that is thousands of years old, you get some quite predictable uh, results. But there are, there are definitely things that we can bring back from Inner Mongolia. I don't know if anyone here is from Ho Ho or Inner Mongolia. No? Well, one of the traditions I think we should bring back is um, what I learned was that the getting off your horse drink, um, which basically means that when you get off your coach, before you're allowed to start eating, you have to down these big silver dishes um, of baiju. And then once they think that you've had enough, only at that stage are you allowed to get up and make a speech. Um, it's, it's, um, if anyone wants to see this tradition in action, uh, they should go to the House of Lords, uh, where we have a very similar tradition uh, in operation Monday to Thursday. Um, I was only defeated once. I was only defeated once uh, in Qingdao, where... Um, Qingdao, as many of you all know, is the home not just to uh, the great Qingdao beer, but also some very good uh, red wine um, and um, some baiju of their own. Um, I, I was only defeated by the vice mayor who decided to put in one glass not just the Qingdao beer, but the Qingdao red wine and the baiju on top, <laughs> and then knock the whole thing down uh, at once. Um, at that stage, I'm afraid my diplomatic skills deserted me, and um, I, had to, I had to admit defeat. Um, but, you know, these are the traditions that I hope that more and more people in our country will share. Because as we get to know each other better over the future, we need more whiskey drinking in China and more baiju drinking um, in Britain. And I guess the starting point for the book is that this is not something that is simply going to enrich our lives, although it will. This is something that is fundamentally important to the future of our country. A few months ago, uh, President Obama and Xi Jinping sat down uh, for their first bilateral uh, in California, a few thousand miles away from here. And what was extraordinary about the photos that came out of that summit, it's very relaxed, very casual, what was very striking is that for us here in Britain, each of those two leaders are now probably impor as important as each other to the future of our country. Not something that at any point in our past history we could have said that, but it is probably true today. And so just as America has pivoted east over the course of the Obama presidency, the argument of the book is that Britain now needs to follow suite. And we have to now begin pivoting east. And we have to get ourselves organised. You can't take a laissez-faire approach to this kind of business. We do not share a border. We do not share a language. We do not share a religion. A religion. In fact, we share a history of conflict. A very famous historian of the East India Company once described UK-China relations back in the 19th century like this. He said, we exported courage and we imported tea. That would have been nice if it was true. Because of course what we were not exporting was courage. What we were exporting was opium. And we fought two vicious and brutal wars in order to protect that disgraceful privilege. And when Tony Blair went on his first state visit after 
um, the handover to Hong Kong was successfully complete. The British Council and British, the, the British diplomatic community uh, in China uh, was doing a lot of background research into what needed to happen during the trip. And one of the things that was very striking in the research that they did amongst Chinese people is that people still brought up the Opium War. And for anyone who's gone round the, uh, the party's museum in Tiananmen Square and you see that exhibition about the road uh, to rejuvenation, of course it starts with the Opium War. And so this is you know, a stain on our kind of history that we can't pretend is not there. And it just, I think, raises the stakes for our diplomatic work, but it also just reminds us that in a world where we don't share borders and we don't share religions and we don't share you know, too much cultural history either, we can't pretend that UK-China relations are just going to kind of foster themselves by some kind of magic. We're actually going to have to get organised, we're going to have to think about it, and we need to get on with it. Because the truth is, here in Britain, we are in a bit of a hole. My uh, leaving advice to my successor at the Treasury is now fairly well known. Uh, but I'm afraid the reality is that since 2010, we've become even worse off than we were back then. If you look at what's happened to our economy, we are still an economy that is smaller than we were at our peak before the crash, while other countries like America and Germany are actually much bigger. Our productivity in this country is not higher than in 2010, it is 7% lower. If you look at what's happening to whether our economy is rebalancing, I'm afraid the conclusion is that it isn't. Our investment rate, substantially lower than it was back in 2010. UK corporates today are sitting on 500 billion pounds worth of cash that they are not investing because they don't have the confidence to invest. If you look at our export performance, despite a 20% depreciation in the pound, our export growth has been practically anemic. The Office of Budget Responsibility has now had to revise down three times its forecasts for our export growth. By now, trade should have been a growth booster and instead it is a drag on growth. So if we want to kind of rebuild our fortunes as a country, my argument is that one of the best ways in which we can do that is to rebuild our strength and rebuild our credentials as a mighty trading nation once more. That was always the plan. If you go back to the economic forecast of 2010, the idea was that trade was going to grow and grow and grow. That's what needs to happen. But that is not what is happening today. And as we set about this task, we should just remember something from our history. If you stand up in the House of Commons uh, to speak on the front bench, you, you rest your elbows on a dispatch box. And it's a, it's a gift of the people of New Zealand. And it rests on a table that is a gift, I think, of the people of uh, Canada. The Speaker's chair, the Speaker who sits in the House of Commons and presides over us, uh, is a gift of the people of Jamaica. The doors that come into the House of Commons chamber are gifts from the people of India and Pakistan. The House of Commons chamber was rebuilt by friends all over the Commonwealth back in the uh, mid-1940s after German incendiary bombs destroyed the House of Commons during an incendiary attack in 1942. And just as the Commonwealth and just as our neighbours in Europe and just as our neighbours in America helped us rebuild in the 1940s and 50s, they helped us rebuild the House of Commons while they were at it. The challenge for us today is that our neighbours in Europe, our neighbours across the Atlantic in America, are in as much trouble as we are. They are not going to be high growth economies for many, many years to come. You can never write off the strength of Europe, you can never write off the strength of America, but nor can you rely on it either. And that's why we need to start turning east. This was always predicted to be the Asian century but the global crash has meant something incredibly significant. It's arrived 20 years faster than we expected. Back in, I think, about 2004, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jim O'Neill, was making some forecasts about the arrival of the BRIC economies. And I think back then he forecast that China would be the world's biggest economy by about 2041. Now, 
Some argue we're already at that point. The OECD says we'll reach that point in the first year of the next parliament. The global crash means something very, very significant. The global crash means that the Asian century is arriving 20 years faster than we expected. And the challenge for us is that we're not ready. And so that was the inspiration for writing the book. It's not really a book about China. It's actually more of a book about Britain, but a Britain that needs to prosper in the Asian century. So if Britain is going to turn east, the exam question then becomes, what are we going to do about it? And what I suppose Chinese friends taught me is that we need to answer the question, not first by asking what's in our own interest, but by asking what is in China's interest. What is it that China needs to do over the next 20 or 30 years in order to prosper? A friend of mine, Kerry Brown, who was the, the head of the Asia programme at Chatham House and is now uh, a professor at um, University of Sydney, said to me while I was writing the book, part of the challenge that the Communist Party has right now is that Mao Zedong thought and Zheng Xiaomin's key points, uh, you know, they're about as relevant to most ordinary Chinese people as medieval Latin. The CCP is struggling to reinvent its political appeal and its political messaging for a state that is arriving for them much faster than they expected. And that's why it was so fascinating to see Xi, uh, Xi Jinping pronounce some very westernized political messaging. The China dream was the great declaration of the last year, a goal of doubling living standards by 2020. But if that is to happen, then there are three big changes that need to happen in China. Many of you uh, here will be on Twitter, probably. I think you're on, you're on Twitter. Um, is anybody here on Sinovevo as well? Yeah, some people. So um, there's a great research, British research company in Shanghai called Blue Flamingo. And you can, you can look at their blog. They've got a great thing that they do everywhere. They do Sinovevo Wednesday, where on the Wednesday of every week, they go through what's going on on um, Sinovevo and they, they write a blog about it. And one of the blogs that caught my eye was the phenomenon of little migratory birds. Little migratory birds. So that holiday period in China each year when tens of millions of children cross the continent to the coastal regions to be with their parents. They can't live with their parents because their parents are migrants. They have no hoku in the cities in which they live. They have no healthcare rights or insurance rights often no wage enforcement either, and certainly no education rights for their children. China will not rebalance and become an economy that is driven by its consumers rather than its exports unless it builds a welfare state. We have a great National Insurance Act that's now been passed in China, but pension sa savings for most Chinese are nugatory. Healthcare insurance is something that is really expensive. Good healthcare is not available to many in the cities. But if China wants to become a country where workers save less than the 30% of their wages that they currently save, China has to build a welfare state. Has to rebalance its tax policy between the federal level and local government. China will not grow, they will not double living standards by 2020 unless they build a welfare state. So that's the first thing that China needs to do. Second, many people here will have iPhones or iPads. If you just um, turn those over, what are the words that you see? The words that you see are designed by Apple in California, manufactured in China. So many people in China are not concerned about you know, the great success of Foxconn, but they are concerned about why there is no Chinese Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs died, many people in China provoked that question. Why does China not have a Steve Jobs? If you take that iPhone or if you take that iPad off the shelf in America, it costs about $500. Only 5% of that value goes to China. A lot of the rest of it goes to South Korea for components, to Japan and to Germany for components. 
but about two thirds of that money goes to the intellectual property creator, which is Apple. So Apple employs 40,000 people. Foxconn employs about a million people. Apple is worth an awful lot more than Foxconn. And if China is to grow and double living standards over the next 10 years, 10, 15 years, it knows it's got to fix, it's got to solve that iPhone challenge. It's got to become not an IP copier, but an IP creator. It has to become an innovation nation and then a world leading science power. So that's the second thing that China needs to do. It has to build a welfare state, has to become an IP creator, not an IP copier. Third, third is very interesting. The third great challenge, the description of the third great challenge is not described by a Chinese politician, but by an American politician, by Larry Summers, just missed out on becoming the chair of the Federal Reserve. He had a great phrase which he used in a Princeton lecture a few years ago. He called it the balance of terror. The balance of terror between America and China, which has its roots in the fact that China owns trillions of dollars of American treasury bills. When you have exchange surpluses that are so big as China's, there are very few places you can put that amount of cash. And so the money goes into US treasury bills. But there's a problem. US treasury bills don't give you a very good return. And actually, with the depreciation risk, because of quantitative easing in America, the risk is that actually the Chinese people, whose money this is, are actually going to be losing an awful lot of money over the next few years. That is the balance of terror. But look, if China follows the path of an ordinary developing economy over the next 10 years, by 2020, it's not just going to have a few trillion dollars worth of US Treasury bills to worry about. It will be investing $2 trillion a year in overseas foreign investment. Today, China owns 1.5% of the global asset base. It invests the same amount of money abroad as Denmark or Singapore. That's going to radically change over the next 10 to 15 years. But it's not going to put any more money into this balance of terror with America. So this is challenge number three for China. Where is it going to invest a couple of trillion dollars a year? So that's the second big argument in the book. Let's think about what are the things that China needs to do in order to grow living standards by 2020. Build a welfare state, become an innovation nation, and find a lot more places to put $2 trillion a year. Now, for us, this then becomes the author, the mother, of what I think are three big win-wins. In this country, we've been operating a welfare state for getting on for a century. Last year, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Beveridge Report, published in 1942, in the middle of the Second World War comprehensive blueprint for the building of a welfare state in Britain. Now, we can't tell China how to solve its affordable housing crisis. We can't help you know, tackle that kind of problem. But we know an awful lot about the soft infrastructure of welfare states, asset management, the rule of law, healthcare management, life science. The opportunity that there is for Britain and for Europe is to build a much stronger partnership where we share that kind of expertise that China needs to build a welfare state. But as the consumer market grows, we should be using our membership of the world's greatest free trade club, otherwise known as the European Union, to batter open the doors of trade, not just for financial services, but for the 10 sectors where we have great industrial strengths. When I was a minister, in fact, when we started the economic and finance dialogue, when we first went, we took a big delegation from the City of London and we had a trade strategy that was called, I think, I think we actually call it the crown, uh, the jewel in the crown. The City of London was the jewel in the crown. And our job was to try and get the jewel in the crown out and about as fast and as furiously <coughs> as we could. But actually, when you talk to people in Britain about our great export strengths, it's not just financial services. Actually, it's automotive. It's pharmaceutical. It's advertising. It's increasingly environmental services. Some of the biggest builders of Chinese cities are companies like Arab or indeed Bureau Hapold. You know, there are 10 sectors where we have great strength and big opportunities in China, not least higher education. So actually our strategy is, should not be all about the jewel in the crown. Our strategy should be about the crown jewels. But the quid pro quo is that hands-on help 
building the soft infrastructure that China needs to build a welfare state. So that's win-win number one. Win-win number two is how do we become partners in pioneering together with China? You're in one of the best universities in the world right now. Uh, and we have not just Leeds, actually we've got quite a lot of them. We have a large number of universities in the top 150. But better than that, we have some of the greatest companies in the world that <coughs> spend the most in the world on research and development, not least in life science. Also financial services, also telecoms, also automotive, also green technologies. The challenge for us is how do we connect the innovation that we have in this country with the hunger for innovation that there is in China. Now, I happen to think that university to university links will be one of the most effective ways in which we can do that. So if you take my, I'm from Birmingham, if you take my university, University of Birmingham, it's building an extraordinary partnership with Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou, where they are doing all kinds of great work on life science, but they're also thinking how do they spin in much of their work on high value manufacturing as well. Those kind of bridges that are actually built and assembled and put together and nurtured and watered by universities will increasingly become the bridges on which we can do so much business, which is why Business Confucius Institute is such an important combination of words, because for many businesses, actually the bridges that higher education institutions build will be the bridges on which they want to walk across. So that is the second great win-win. Why is it important for us? Because 99% of the world's innovation will soon come from outside Britain. The greatest companies that are investing in China today said this to me. They said, we would be in China today if we didn't sell anything. We would be in China because we are going to learn more there than we're going to learn anywhere else on the planet over the next 15 years. And that even smarter companies are thinking more strategically. They're thinking about how do we grow with and within China? How do we partner with Chinese companies as China goes global? If you look at the biggest companies in the world, if you look at a big league table of the biggest companies in the world, actually very few of them are Chinese. Very few of them. 1,400 companies now control half of the world's innovation, spending. Very few of them are Chinese. Most of them are from France, Germany, Britain and America. So we have a great deal to offer Chinese companies that want to go global. I talked about uh, my newfound love of Baijiu. One of the most interesting deals that was done in China recently is Diageo's takeover of a very old, well-established Baijiu manufacturer. That deal was done because the Chinese saw a partner in Diageo who could take that Baijiu brand and put it in global duty free with all the branding expertise that Di Diageo can bring to bear. And actually, you know, if you go to Dubai or if you go to America, you can now see Chinese Baijiu marketed in a way that was impossible to think of five or ten years ago. And that is the kind of win-win that is there for the taking if we think about how we become partners in pioneering. The third win-win is investment. George Osborne had a very successful trip in China. There was lots of controversy in Britain about Chinese investment in nuclear power here in Britain. Get used to that, because that is what is going to happen far, far faster in the years to come. We should be setting out to become the Chinese favourite place in the world to invest. We've got an investment crisis in this country. We have banks that have deleveraged to a bigger extent than any other banking system in Europe. We have creaking public infrastructure. We have business investment that's lower than it was before the peak. We are an investment star of the economy. We should be welcoming investment with open arms. But the challenge for us, politically, is that investment has always got to be a two-way street. When Premier Wen came to Birmingham, he celebrated uh, the renaissance of MG Rover. It was a great story, great pictures, local politicians wanted to be all over it. Here was Chinese investment that was creating new jobs. It was a, an easy, good story to tell. But not all investment in the future will be like that. 
And if you want politicians to go in to defend that kind of investment, it's far easier if you're able to point to British companies that are investing significantly in China. So just as we want to kind of welcome Chinese investment in Britain politically and I think economically, it's going to become more and more important to show that it's not just a one-way street, but it is a two-way street. So these are no more than first thoughts in order to try and get uh, a debate going. Very often when you look at the coverage of um, China here in Britain, it's a kind of commentary, isn't it? You know, is China going to grow uh, fast or slow? Is there going to be a hard landing or a soft landing? Is there going to be political reform or isn't there? Uh, are we um, going to take human rights issues on head on or are we going to do it softly, softly? You know, it's often a kind of commentary on where China is going. And that's very important, but actually it's not as important as the debate about where Britain and China are going to go together and how we get that job done. Many of you will have seen, like me, um, the great book by Bill Clinton, his memoirs that were published a few years ago. There are um, many good stories in that book, but the most important lesson in that book for me is a, a quote that he gives about halfway through. He's just lost his first election as governor of Arkansas, and he's moping around the back streets of Arkansas, and he's basically moaning at people and saying, you know, why was it that I lost? I did a great job, didn't I? And someone says to him, well, sure, but we paid you to go to work, didn't we? Politics, ultimately, is about the future. And this is Clinton's first law of politics. Elections are not about the past. They're about the future. And that's why this debate is so important. Back home in Birmingham, my children will be going to bed shortly, I hope. Um, by the time that they are at Leeds or wherever they choose to go and study, China will probably be the world's biggest economy. It will have re-established the status that it had a couple of hundred years ago before the Opium Wars. The challenge for us in politics, in business, in universities, is to figure out how in this new world which is coming do we make sure that Britain and China's relations create a better, richer, and yes, more harmonious world for my children who are home in Birmingham and for your children too? I'll stop there. Very happy to take questions. Thanks Thank very much very indeed. Much.